Hello and welcome to Science Unscripted. It's Connor here. And Gabe. And dairy cows. Uh, this, this past summer, where I'm from, the Midwestern United States, they're dropping dead. Reuters did a report on it. Nobody knows the exact number because there are millions and millions and millions of cows in the Midwest, dairy land. Uh, hundreds died in Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas. Thousands died the year before in Kansas because of hot temperatures, rising temperatures. Cows cannot deal with the heat. So and it's a logical consequence of climate change. Yeah, given it? how much milk we drink, something has to be done about these cows. And something apparently has to be done genetically. Uh, we're going to be speaking today to a, an agriculture scientist about how to do that. Uh, he's in Florida, in the, in the U.S. state of Florida. Science Unscripted. Okay. Yeah, my name is Pete Hansen. I've been interested in cows since I was a little boy, but I've been uh, doing research on cows for about 45 or 50 years now. And one of the major areas of interest is how cows adapt to high temperatures. Living here in Florida, that's a daily issue for us. And how are you helping these cows adapt to those extremely hot temperatures? You know, there's a lot of variation genetically in the world's cattle population. And some breeds of cattle are very resistant genetically to heat stress. So we're trying to find those genes and then transfer them in to breeds of cattle like the Holstein that evolved in Northern Europe that don't have genetic resistance to heat stress. The most progress we've made is in identifying a mutation in one gene. And this mutation, the slick mutation, causes animals to have really short hair, which makes it easier for them to lose their body heat to the surrounding environment and better regulate their body temperature during heat stress when it's really hot outside. So this is a selective breeding process, right, and not um, a retroactive genetic modification like CRISPR-Cas9? The cattle that exist today, it's yeah, a genetic uh, breeding program. But there are efforts to use CRISPR-Cas9 to introduce these same kind of mutations into cattle. Is this unique with cows, this, this idea? The idea that, look, uh, climate change is very obviously happening and we just have to adapt to it somehow. So uh, we're doing this with cows. What uh, Are other animals having this tried out on them uh, or is this unique? Yeah, I think heat stress affects all mammals, so pigs, horses, cattle, and it affects all homeotherms, so birds. You know, all the animals that regulate their body temperature at a high level, just birds and mammals. The cow is probably more sensitive to heat stress than any of those other animals because it produces so much milk because we've selected cows for milk yield for hundreds of years. And that increased milk yield increases the cow's metabolic rate, increases her heat production. So a lactating dairy cow produces two to four times more heat than a animal that's not lactating. So it makes it very difficult for them to cope with, with heat stress. How has the performance of the cows that have been bred in this way been? Are they, are they producing as much milk or are any, have any problems arisen? Any, anything um, deleterious or, or harmful or unhealthy for the cows? Yeah, we, you know, we have, it's, it's an interesting mutation. Um, if you look at just the, what, the natural animals that have this mutation, there's actually six separate mutations in the same gene that have arisen in cattle. So for that to happen naturally, it had to be a desirable trait, you know, not a negative trait. Because if it was a negative trait, it never would have survived in the population. It would have been selected against naturally. So I, I think it's a desirable trait in hot climates. We have not seen any negative consequences of the mutation. You know, uh, 
So, I mean, it's something that we're focused on, but uh, we haven't seen any negative effects. When other researchers, other biologists out there uh, start thinking this way, start doing experiments in this way on other animals, are there concerns that they should have in mind or risks, especially with, let's say, retroactive genetic modification, if you're, if you're kind of using a pair of genetic scissors to cut out certain genes and change those animals? What what could happen or what do researchers have to think about when they do stuff like this? Yeah. So, I mean, what we've done with uh, slick mutation in Holstein is just the same kind of natural selective breeding that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of years. So it's nothing new. If you're talking about gene editing, just like you say, using a genetic scissors to snip out a little piece of DNA and put in a slightly different version, um, certainly scientists w worry about what is the normal role of that gene and will this change in the gene change any of the functions that uh, that gene plays. And, uh, you know, right now there's an intense regulatory environment, so it's not easy to introduce those kind of animals into the food chain until it's certain that there's no negative effects on the animal or any changes in the composition of the food that would come from the animal. Are you in contact with any of the dairy farmers? Um... Whose, whose cows yeah. have, have been have been modified? So, I mean, again, this is like a natural mutation, right? So there's no regulation by any government agency. There are, there's, this mutation is called the slick mutation because animals have very short hair. They look nice and shiny. Um, I think a slick animal was just born in Germany. So um, commercially available semen can be purchased and you can produce slick animals. So I think here in the United States, probably a couple thousand breedings a month are going on to produce uh, slick Holstein. So it's getting, it, it's certainly a, um, there are not many slick Holsteins in the United States, but Farmers are starting to implement that technology. Do you think that this might be a, a path forward with a change in climate? It's a, it's a strange one. It's not one I'd really thought about until your study popped up. The idea that, you know, as we read these headlines about animal species dying out because they're the, the place that they have always lived or for the last couple of hundred thousand years is becoming warmer and less hospitable to them, that scientists can go in and modify them in a similar manner to make them more resistant to, to heat. Yeah, it's certainly easier to do technically with domesticated animals than with wild species. And yes, there's a lot of concern about what's going to happen to populations of uh, wild species of animals with climate change. Some of those populations will move. They won't uh, be threatened necessarily, but other, other species will be. Yeah, I think this is an approach in the domestic animal field for sure. In the wild, some natural mutations will occur. I mean, one thing to think about is every animal has mutations that its parents didn't have, right? Mutations occur spontaneously. So usually they're bad and uh, are selected against naturally. But with climate change, there'll be some naturally occurring mutations in a wild species that make it more resistant to heat stress. So those, if they do occur, would probably get selected for in a, in a world that's getting hotter and hotter. Pete, there are probably farmers all over the world that would be interested in giving this mutation to their cows, how, how could they find it if they're looking for it? Or yeah, what, what could they do to, to get it? Um, so there are um, bulls that have the slick mutation 
There are bulls in the Holstein breed. I think in the next few years there will be, well, I guess there are right now. There's bulls in the Jersey breed in New Zealand that have this mutation. And so people are selling that semen. The big restriction, of course, is related to importation. Can semen from the United States be uh, exported into Germany or whatever country? So, um, you know, there are commercial companies that sell semen and they sell semen internationally. And some of those companies have cattle with this gene. And I'm sure they would like to, um, you know, expand their market and uh, sell these semen from these bulls, you know, in a variety of different places. And it's happening. How does it work in the, in the, in the cow or steer world? If I, if I want to if I want to have these kinds of cows, these slick cows, and I buy either the bull to breed them with or the, or the semen, is this like is this a luxury product right now? Would it be the equivalent of buying a supercar as opposed to a regular car? Is it really expensive or is it relatively easy to get? It's not expensive. It's it's not, yeah, it's not a significant cost really. There's no real premium on uh, semen from bulls with this gene, so it's something. You know, from a practical point of view, the very, very, very best bulls in terms of um, producing females that will produce a lot of milk, uh, they don't have that mutation. So if you use a slick bull, he's a good bull genetically in terms of milk yield or butter fat, but he's not the very, very best. So a farmer has to make a decision, do I want the very best bull? but he's not as heat resistant, or am I willing to use a bull that's not as good and get the heat resistance? Over time, uh, this gene will get incorporated into more and more lines of cattle, and the slick bulls will be just as good genetically for milk yield as um, any bull. But, you know, it's been relatively recent that it's been introduced into commercial lines of cattle. So still the very, very best lines of cattle don't have the mutation. And it, uh, just because I love going full science fiction once in a while, what, what about a, a slick human in the future for, a, for an ever warming world, right? <laughs> Would that work? Could we, could we make ourselves slicker and be way more okay with the changing global temperatures? Can you move from agriculture science to, I don't know, bioscience and, and help them out, Pete? <laughs> you know, I don't understand much about human evolution, but uh, we've lost most of our body hair. So, uh, you know, compared to most mammals, uh, the insulative layer of hair that restricts flow of heat from our bodies is pretty minimal already. But, you know, you bring that up, this mutation is uh, in a gene that uh, controls hair length. And there are mutations in humans um, that are, are in the same gene. So I don't know what the effect is on their, on their body hair, but uh, there's probably similar type of phenomenon going on in humans as in cattle or other species. Yeah, well, you, but I don't want to get involved in genetic engineering of humans. Of course, of course. No, you, you say you say humans have lost most of their body hair, but you haven't seen my colleague Gabriel Board in the locker room. He's a he's a um, a counter I got hair everywhere, leader. Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Pete Hansen speaking to us there from Florida. Yeah, and the the the, the hair reference. Is mostly actually about your face. It's you've got a good you've got a good winter beard going right now. I can grow it quick. I, this one took me like twenty five minutes. It's <laughs> gonna like how do you grow? Do you do <laughs> and the hair start coming out? No way. No. This this story is close to my heart, Connor. Like I said at the top of the show, I'm I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Wisconsin, where probably cows died this past summer, and uh, I was with one of my daughters at um, in, in Dodge County, the the place where I live, not far from Beaver Dam, the city I live. And there is a, a fair every summer. And at that fair, dairy cows are judged. 
And if if you want to listen to what that competition or judging yes, sounds I, like. <laughs> yes, I do. Here you go. Certainly an exceptional group of uh, spring calves here to start off our open show today. I'll go ahead with the young ladies heifer coming out in first. The heifer, that's a, a very high style kind of a heifer. You love that, that silkiness that she has. She's got that beautiful open sweepness to that rib structure. She's got that gorgeous depth and drop of forerib and rear rib to go with it. And I give her the advantage and width all the way. There is something beautiful about, um, okay. it's your language, yeah. but the words are different. The cadence is different. It it it. Well, let, let me paint a picture about what, what that kind of looks like. So... This is a barn. This is a. There are about forty people inside a large open barn, and so he said that lady bring her. The, the the girls who bring the cows out are wearing white pants. They bring the cows out in front of the judges, and the 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 the, the heifer in this case is judged based on its appearance, how it's looking. The reason why I'm talking about this is I went here to this competition with Lynn, and in the back, in the stalls where the cows were being, were, were just kind of hanging out. Mm. They were being wiped down with washcloths, sprayed with with water to keep them cool. The heat index was 106 Fahrenheit. That, that That's the reality for these cows. Just, just, just roasting. Just survive. They, 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 they are hot. And they weren't even in the sun. Yeah, so the future Dodge County Fair, 100 years from now, if we haven't managed to cool our planet, is more hairless versions of those same Heifers cows? Heifers with the slick mutation, at least for now. Maybe the maybe Pete Hansen and his crew are going to come up with some more mutations to help these cows adapt and deal with this. But something is going to have to be done. Well, And then what are they going to judge their beauty on, if not for the, the fur coat? It'll be the skin? Well, you heard right there, the, the, the rib structure is one oh, thing. Oh, true, true. That is a part of the aesthetic beauty of a cow, I suppose. I, wouldn't, I, I really don't know what, what constitutes that. They make great noises. In any case. They, they make really... Oh, yeah, no, you... Uh, but you make... Uh, uh, our last little dose of non... Complete and utter nonsense. Gabe can do a really good cow impression. And mm. we recorded it before. I think we were sitting in the studio before we talked to Pete. Mm-hmm. And he, we, we didn't have him on the line yet. And you started doing them into the mic. And I believe we have those clips here. No, we don't. But I can do one for you right oh, now. Oh, okay. I thought I we lost, had him. I lost the recording. Damn it. Okay. So let me just... Let me do one right now. Okay. Give it to me. Mm-hmm. One more. (laughs) If you, too, can sound like a cow, please email us that noise. We are su at dw.com. Science Unscripted.